Next up is our first keynote speaker of this evening, and he's an internet pioneer. He's a first chair, a vice chairman of ICANN. He's pioneered Belt and Road blockchain, and I fondly also remember him from his statement about being naked on the internet, and that we all have been so for a while. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Pindar Wong from Hong Kong. Thank, thank you so much, Katya. I have the clicker of power. And um, first of all, thank you for your Serene Highness and all the organizers here for having me. It's one of the few places in the world I can wear my orange Bitcoin shirt, and that is absolutely natural. Um, so tonight's sort of keynote is actually I'm the entertainment. So all the slides are on the internet. You know, don't worry about the data. It's actually tr I'm trying to start a uh, conversation. Um, so Rutger and I obviously we had this, uh, this, this discussion about an odyssey, right? An odyssey, actually, I had to look it up. It's actually a, it's, it's a famous poem, right, by Homer, right? It's actually his second poem. The second thing is like, you know, Polaris. Now I know it's the, the, the North Star. And as you heard uh, him speak earlier, it's, there, there may be an internal star that we need. And so it's on the internal side uh, that I can start talking about the Tao of Web3. And, and I would like to do so by connecting some dots. So, you know, I went to the, the Palace Museum in summer, and I know from that visit that the Dutch, you really like your maps, right, your, your, your cart. And so here's the map for my talk this evening. It's going to be in three sections. The first, and then we'll reveal around, but, you know, you just you know, remember these three icons, okay, because that will help you. Um, the second thing I was remarked, and I'm going to need some help here because I don't know how to, how to say this correctly, is be speak by height, right? This, you know, this ability to be very, very candid. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. So, you know, in my culture, that may be slightly different, but I'm going to be pretty direct. So one of my favorite people to hang out with, in fact, these days are anthropologists, and I met one today. And in the uh, archival in, in Uktek, there is um, basically Elena Ostrom. She's an she's a anthropologist, and we are in the Hall of Nights. And so this is my favorite quote that I normally end my presentation, but I'm going to actually do it at the beginning, which is, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful citizens, committed citizens, can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Now, this evening, you are in the Hall of Knights. So, believe it or not, you're all knights, <laughs> okay? You're gonna, and knights are very, very brave, and you have this wonderful image of this, this upside-down ship, and your ancestors were very, very brave as they set out into the horizon, not really knowing where, the, where, the, where this journey is going to be. So, take, go with me for this journey, at least for my presentation. And when, when, when Rutger asked me, he's like, you know, please come and talk about the Tao of Web3. I'm like, oh, no, my goodness. You know, what on earth, you know, do I really want to do that? You know, do I really want to talk about this symbol, which I talked about actually at the UN for good, talking about scaling AI and how consciousness invents consciousness and some of the tensions in terms of China, US, the AI uh, discussions. I kind of know about the Tao, but I have no idea about what Web3 is. I know about the pre-web, right? That was the time that we had this text-only world where it was wonderful. We didn't care who you were, just the beauty of your ideas. And ever since that time, in that text-only world, we had to invent something called a smiley, right? And in our communication now with all you on your phones, we've kind of gone back to Egypt. We have kind of hieroglyphics, right? right? So we're moving this. But it's kind of very strange that in order to communicate as human beings, we need to move beyond text. So when he talked about Web3, I'm like, oh, no, again, like, I have no idea. How am I going to talk about the DAO of Web3 when I don't even know what it is, right? So I'm an explorer just like all of you. So also being an engineer, I said, well, you know, Web3, what am I going to do? What does it mean? Is it going to be a network of blockchains, right, and interoperability between that? So I think not. So in the, in, in, in the interest of fair speech, and, and I'm going to say this is, the, this is the, the end slide, the most important which is we need to invent yin money, right? This yin yang, this very famous Taoist symbol. Or you can better think of it as female money, right? And the reason why I want to get to this is that nearly all the money we have today in the atomic world, the world of, of atoms, okay, is zero sum, right? Either I have it or you have it. So we're going to have to change the way we're thinking 
about how we view, in fact, we need a new kind of money. We have a monoculture in money. Bitcoin is an example of something different. But even Bitcoin is either I have the Bitcoin or you have the Bitcoin. We don't have a we. So this talk tonight is about really about how to think about having female money, yin money, and all the different kinds of positive sum games that we can develop. This is new. So this, for me, is what Web3 is about. It's changing the way that we measure so-called success, having a new money, because money is one of the great inventions of humankind. Right? It allows us to communicate, at, cooperate at scale. The other one is, is actually the rule of law. And so I'm going to talk about sort of this, uh, the rule of words, right? Uh, on the one hand, and the rule of numbers on the other hand. Again, this yin-yang symbol will be coming. But I know the Dutch, you're very, very practical people, and you want to know, so what? You know, I want, what, what, you know, what can I do today? And so the summary here is that we need to do two things. And this is kind of like the summary of this little Belt and Road discussion. Many people are concerned that we're going to build a, you know, this huge trade infrastructure. They don't know about the solar, the green belt, the solar array from Europe to China, where we basically, the sun never sets on it. And there are really two things. One is, in the products that come out, do two things. On the product itself, figure out or show the recycled frequency count. How many times was this product reused? Right? Just around the corner here, there's a thrift store where you can get Salvation Army clothes. Right? Very cheap. It's like five euro. But that pair of jeans, you know, a thousand liters per pair of jeans, has been reused several times. And we need to have a metric, not because it's cheap in financial terms, but the environmental cost of reusing it needs to be factored in, make it, make, make it more visible. Now, revolutionaries now don't necessarily write uh, manifestos. Some still do. Revolutionaries, as many of you here, write make files, right? these computer codes. Where making money these days is not necessarily what you used to do. It's a command line, literally make money. Bitcoin is an example of that. So what kinds of new money can we invent? Right, which are different, which are not zero sum, either I have it or you have it, but positive sum. So here the work of nature, which I heard several times. Does nature take euro? Does nature take RMB? Of the 21 challenges, I see patterns, right? This notion of energy, right? The other thing is nature takes nutrients, be it carbon, ammonia, what have you. And what I'm trying to say is that there is a need to be sort of moving away from linear thinking. We also heard the notion of complexity. And so one of the research results that I think is very important is this one. If you, if you remember one slide about ecosystem design, it's this. And that there is empirically, if you look at nutrient flow or energy flow and complex adaptive networks, be it ecology, there is, in fact, an only very small window of viability between systems that are so-called robust and those which are sustainable. And what's interesting about this window is that there's this little window, this little green bit, the blue bit at the top, is that it's skewed to one side. It's not in the middle. It's not exactly balanced. But it's skewed to one side. And if we think about the monoculture in money that we have today, we are probably missing about six different kinds of money, right? money which may be ge geographically defined. You cannot spend the money outside this geographical region. Even then, it still suffers from zero-sum thinking, right? Either I have it or you have it, that the, the measure of worth is so-called scarcity. In the digital world, in fact, Bitcoin had to invent scarcity to have sort of uh, any kind of worth. In the physical world, things are scarce. But in the digital world, we have a different modality. We can have as many of anything. Right? So digital is different. So I'm going to touch upon that. But this is the summary in the interest of the presentation. Now, when I think of the Netherlands, I think of this, right? The dams, the polta. You know, you're the most successful in terms of managing the, the, the world in terms of water, right? In terms of the dikes. And there's a great, great delta project in the southern part of the Netherlands. If you look at some of the forecasts in terms of climate change, it's going to be flooding all of that stuff, I would say that, you know, in fact, the boat that you're going to have to get on, it's, it's going to have to be bigger, right? And a lot, a lot of the things we have, uh, you know, we have Exodus, we have perhaps also a Noah-like mentality that we're going to have to all be adventurers and set out to sea again. Now, this sea, another way of looking at the Hague is not necessarily through its shoreline. It's actually through what you've heard earlier in terms of peace and security, and in fact, also another one, justice. 
So the presentation is in three sections, right? Three, peace, security, justice. Let's go. So, section one, peace. I have no idea what peace is. It's the same emotion. Like, you know, peace, what are you talking about? It's, it has the same reaction. I'm really not qualified to talk about peace, right? What we have to do right now is we're going to have to cooperate at planetary scale. We're going to have to cooperate at scale that we have never actually seen before. Right, $50 trillion to just finance the provisions that we need to do for climate change. So that's kind of like my reaction. But I actually come from this part of the world. Right? There are more people living inside this white circle than outside of it. I come from the little so the dot, which is Hong Kong. But it took me 12 hours to get here. Right? So we can think about things in terms of space, or we can start thinking things in terms of time. What was interesting about the previous one was each person was given two minutes, right? other than Rika. So time is, in fact, fair for everyone. So what is it about these networks in time that we're building with blockchain that makes things actually really interesting? Can we move away from the geographic mindset of uh, networks of geography, of conquest, to thinking about networks of cooperation in time. So, the Belt and Road Initiative, right, many people are very apprehensive about that. They don't necessarily understand the deep thinking that we've done in terms of thinking about the future of manufacturing and how actually to make things sustainable. Now, it's very privileged to have the uh, sort of Rotterdam being sort of, depending on how you look at it, either the beginning or the end of this Belt and Road. And two days ago, obviously, the United States, Japan, and Australia announced their own sort of competitive uh, alternative called the Blue Dot Network. But what I can share with you as far as this is that things are going to have to be provably sustainable, at least on the Belt and Road. What does it mean by that? We can no longer assume that you did things and it's environmentally OK, right? It's not a question of innocent until proven, Guinness, uh, innocent until proven guilty. It's, in fact, Assume guilty until you're proven innocent. In fact, it's the opposite way around. So when you buy a product, can you think about, can you show me through blockchain's wonderful selective transparency model that that product, I can see the provenance, that everywhere along that line, you know, they did the right thing. So also along the Belt and Road, I have the Halal blockchain that does the Islamic finance, but we're not going to get into that. The key point here is provable sustainability. You can look at my Harvard Business Review article. There's some stuff coming about that, or this stuff online on, on Coindesk. So practical things, right? Everyone in Dutch is practical. So how can we implement something very clear, which is re recycled fr uh, frequency count? How many times was that chair recycled? How many times is it actually used? How many times is a cup? You make the cup once, but as I met yesterday with the, the very uh, sort of recluse Dutch genius, Daniel Erasmus, of which most of this work, by the way, has been over a five-year collaboration. It's a real privilege to have two hours with him yesterday. So Daniel obviously talks about you know, the cup. The cup you can make once, but you can wash it how many times? 10,000, 1,000? or the service business. So as we automate in the sphere of AI, we've gone through the period where we're automating muscle, right? Industrial revolution. The current revolution is automating the minds. You know, what's left for us? And I would argue it's emotion, right? Currency, emotion as currency, which is kind of yin money. Doing the right thing can actually now be made in practice. So that's the public sort of very thing that we can count. It's very visible. It's the yang, it's the light, so to speak. The dark thing is on every product, print, a decay by date. Now, we begin to see this in plastic bags in Asia. Like, we're expecting this plastic bag to decay by this date. So you look at the date, you say, look on the date in the bag, you look at the date here, and it says, well, actually, it's not there yet. But how fast things decay is kind of fuzzy. It's not exact. Right? Nature depends, you, know, you, can, you can talk about all the great innovations in fungi in terms of mycosis, or you can talk about innovations in kelp with regards to sea farms, etc. But nature is not exact. So we have this sort of darker, fuzzy, yin-like measure. It's not exact, but between the two, the recycled frequency count and the decay by date, you have a totality. You have a circle. One is very clear, bright, yang, male, depending on how you have view. And something which is kind of fuzzy, we don't kind of know, do you really need to keep exact date? Something that's not exact. And as a computer scientist, it's just really difficult because we like to be really exact. 
So can you invent the blockchain? It's kind of fuzzy, almost, right? And I argue that, yes, you can, for yin money or currency, emotion as currency. What's interesting about this DAO, if you even look at computers there, you know, Leibniz in terms of binary, it was actually encoded in a book that the Chinese were left to safeguard for 5,000 years, right? The I Ching. And if you look at it, the I Ching as a sort of quantum computer, you look at it, it's actually a way of calculating uncertainty, right? So as you go out, as you're brave as you said so, look at the I Ching, look at the maths. The interesting thing is kind of really as follows, which is, I was given a Stroop waffle yesterday by the organizers. How many sides does a Stroop waffle have? One, two, or three? Who thinks one? No one. How many sides does a Stroop waffle have? Who thinks two? Okay. Who thinks three? The edge. Wonderful. Now, I think a Stroop waffle, like any coin, has three sides. So the second question is, how do you make that coin stand on its edge? Do you just put it there? Is it stable? I would say if forces are spinning, okay, it can be stable. So I need some help from my wonderful assist, uh, uh, sort of boss, if I may. Right. So in the first thing, I'm not sure if actually this is the first time in several hundred years of football has been inside the Hall of Knights. Uh, I had to ask sort of protocol permission, but the football is very useful because a football is a zero-sum game. We have two teams. They fight over one physical ball. In your imagination, let's make the ball larger. Not a ball like a football, where we both compete, zero-sum, only I can have the ball or you have the ball. But let's make, in your imagination as humans, a ball the size of the room. Could you still play football? You could probably still, right? In the first picture of, of what I perceive as Amsterdam, there's a missing ball, which is now imagine that the humans are not playing the ball, but the ball is the size of a planet. Who is playing then? Is Mother Earth playing humans? Is this notion of scarcity actually a game that Mother Earth is playing with us that we can't see? That we're gonna have to cooperate in a positive some way that we've never seen? Now, I'm not really a sportsman, but what I wanted to do is demonstrate this, which is, if you can spin it, imagine I'm spinning this on my finger like a basketball player. It's stable. It's stable enough to do something, so that's different. So I'm gonna get into this, and I need some can you catch? Okay, so that's the end, of, the end of the audience participation. Okay, so peace, right? So chapter one, peace, the circle, yin yang, okay? Stable enough that it's evolvable. And the most interesting thing about stable enough evolvable is this structure, which, sorry, I'm going backwards. Can I go back two slides? Sorry, this one, this one, this one, is this. What many of the people you don't know is that the I Ching, this book with the Taoist symbol, actually encodes DNA, including the stop codons. In fact, if you start looking at the maths behind it, it's kind of really, really interesting. But how on earth would you encode the whole human DNA inside a book which is 4,000 years old? So this is like an exercise for the reader, but that's a stable structure. All of our DNA is very similar, and yet we are all different. We're stable enough as a form to generate all these ideas, right? So this whole notion of the ecosystems you design, principle here is, can you see it? Right? Is it stable enough to evolve? Chapter two, right? Oops, if I get the donut. Security. Security, big heavies, people in uniforms, right? Triangles, big, tall, wide at the top hopefully narrow at the waist, right? I would argue that that's kind of like a male energy, a yang energy. So when I ask security, the, the answer is borders, right? We still think in terms of worlds and borders, and my reaction is, oh, I, you know, I come from the networking side, you know? Where I argue it's in fact nations versus networks, and that's my experience over the last 20 different years. With the deployment of the internet, which began life as this, something very simple, it evolved into a very, very complex adaptive system. The problem was this, is that we got identity wrong. You know, in 1994, there's a very famous cartoon. On the internet now, no one knows you're a dog, right? Some of you might remember it. Right now, with the surveillance capitalism model, right, 
The other one is that with, you know, the metadata is the message. We don't need to see the message. We just need to see the patterns of life and patterns of cooperation. And we can more or less deduce, not with certainty, but something close enough, the patterns of life. So that's kind of like a big mistake, right? It's oops, right? The internet moment. And I argue in terms of this naked internet uh, speech that in fact topology over geography matters more now, right? In terms of these networks of time that we have, like where you are in the network is in fact more strategically useful than being where you were actually business in geography. Why? Because you know, the UK, in spite of Brexit, is as a continent always going to be next to Europe. On the internet, on however, everyone, you know, you can't divorce your neighbors in geography. Right? On the internet, everyone's your neighbor, and everywhere's potentially a bad neighborhood. So this notion of topological view, again, changing the, the world view from, yes, the sun clearly goes around the earth to something different, requires a, ch a change in mindset. So what I would argue right now is that we've already seen the First World War, right? There's a media company uh, right now who has over 2.3 billion users. They want to introduce a cryptocurrency. That's larger than a country. That's larger than a continent. That's probably the populations of India and China combined. What happens if this social platform introduces a military? <laughs> right? What is that then? Is it a nation? It's not a nation. Right? So I would argue with the surveillance capital, Shoshana Zuboff wrote a great book, is that we're already there. We're actually losing consensus reality what your worldview is going to be different from mine, already at the scale of billions, right? If you look at all the sort of fake news arguments, well, in a world with many machines, what about fake data, okay? So I would argue that this sort of uh, security mindset is using a previous model of top-down, right? Governance structures, I decide, you execute, divide and conquer. I would say that that's a very male, active, yang mindset. But there's another one, which is what we've been using for the internet for the last 20 years. And that's a female yin kind of vibe, a different mind, receptive, right? It wasn't divide and conquer, it was connect and liberate. Something totally different. But the point is, that these systems, in fact, if you look at iconography, if you look at the wisdom of the Star of David, for example, this is the way I've tried to represent it, there's a missing or there is a hidden triangle in the absence of the, of the, the story, the space, the empty space. But this linear thinking of I win, you lose leads to zero-sum games. Now, if you look at the current politic, you see this symbol, right, in terms of environment. When I look at this symbol and I say, actually, I think I don't quite agree with that symbol. If I was to color it, I would look at it like that, right? But even then, that's not quite right in my philosophy because it puts two opposite and equal forces in direct linear tug of war. And you get stasis, you get peace, you get no movement like two plates, tectonic plates. But then if and when it happens, bad things happen. So I would argue, again, the Tao, part one, is kind of like this. It's rounded. And I've been meditating on this symbol for like 20 years. And I would say it's a, a design or blueprint for an engine. And when I said that, Rutger said, you've got to come to, <laughs> to, to The Hague to talk about this. But this nonlinear thinking, the circular thinking, the, cir the circular thinking of what nature does is already in your icon. So all you need to remember is this. So can we move away? from circular thinking. Why? Because you actually need both. It's not to say male is better than female or female better than male. It's the whole gestalt. It's the whole system together. And then here we need a kind of new maths. We don't need a binary maths of zero sum, zero and one. We need kind of like a, a three thing, right? We need one and zero and minus one. When we start having these, these different kinds of systems, we can have completely different economic games. So in closing, The Hague, obviously, justice, right? This whole notion of justice is a thought. You know, we rely on the, not the financial system, the rule of numbers as our organizing and cooperation principle, but the law, right? The rule of words. Fuzzy interpretation sometimes, it's not mathematical, but here, of all places on the earth, knows something about law and order. 
In Hong Kong recently, we have some challenges, obviously, but laws also have borders. Again, using this geographic mindset. So if we move away from this in terms of the mathematics and having this, then we might be getting somewhere. But I can't say there's no border. Again, I have this huge, you know, you start speaking, speaking with people who have a, a perimeter mindset. It's like the guys who lived in castles when, you know, gunpowder revolution invented, right? Cast seven feet thick walls was a really good idea when you're inside a castle before gunpowder. When gunpowder came along with their siege cannons, right, uh, the King Charles VIII of France you know, demolishes a, a castle which stood for siege for eight months and seven hours. Right? I would argue the perimeter is dead. Right? Perimeter mindset is dead. Why? Because we have a new perimeter. In fact, this is the hardest of hard borders, unless it's time. It was evidence here, everyone had two minutes, lost time is never found. So with these networks of cooperation and time, blockchain, we have a different way of thinking about it. So this is again as a summary. I think Web3 to me represents the Taoist thinking of yin and yang. In fact, it's the whole thing together. You actually need both. You need a zero-sum game at one level, and you need positive-sum games at the second. I've given two metrics. What are evidence as examples of this? Well, I would say that we all have this. We have, right, before the web, we had like smileys and frownies or whatever they're called. We have likes, we have streaks, we have all these forms of intangible wealth, which aren't exactly limited, right? If you were given a budget of likes or plus ones or whatever social media, as social beings, that doesn't make any sense. It's not finite. So we can do these new things with this new non-circular female money or yin money, and you need both, okay? But the second one hasn't really been invented. I specifically said, look, you know, we need positive sum games. The recycled item count is one of them, and also this notion of when do we expect this product to decay? That very, two very things that we can do today in all the products that we make for customers to actually demand that, I think is gonna be very interesting. So I actually disagree with the earlier notion of I think, therefore I am. I think it's something different, something, something pre-verbal, which is I feel, therefore I am. And evidence of that is gonna be in this file, if we could play that, please. I want you to close your eyes. <laughs> This is the universal language. I did not take or use uh, sort of some spy camera on, on, on Rutger's child. It's kind of like our first words. In fact, we are primal. We feel way before we think. We don't even have language yet. And so it's at this emotional level, at currency is emotion, which is gonna be very, very new. That is why in terms of this nakedness, I have a, a, a symmetry principle. I would argue that yes, we're in a role of sovereigns, that the rule of law, one of our great inventions, is that no one is above the law. But no nation is below mathematics. So with that principle, let's move on to some detail or in closing in terms of the rule of law and the rule of maths. What I would like to do is end with a poem. What many people don't know is that as Homer had the Iliad poem, my name, Pinda, is actually a Greek poet. As you explore the world in front of you, as you find your North Star, as you sail off to the horizon that you didn't know the world was round, the sphere, you thought it was flat, you're gonna be need to be very brave. So this poem is by William Henley, and it's called Invictus. And it goes something like this. Out of the night that covers me, black is the pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods there be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I did not wince nor cry aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloodied but unbowed. Beyond this place looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate how charged the circumstance, the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul.
Thank you very much.